Hello everybody, my name is John Paris. I'm a history professor at the College of DuPage and um, one of my areas of uh, specialty is Latin American history and culture and I am very proud and pleased to be able to uh, deliver a presentation today on Frida Kahlo, one of the most iconic artists not just from all of Mexican history but all of world history. And this is one of numerous um, presentations that we will be delivering at the College of DuPage to commemorate the arrival of many of the most prominent pieces of artwork that Frida Kahlo produced in her lifetime. Frida Kahlo, timeless. So um, without any further ado, please watch the uh, presentation that is uh, subsequent to this little intro, and then we will have a question and answer session. So I look forward to meeting you and chatting with you in about 50 minutes. Thank you and enjoy. Today's presentation is going to be uh, a little overview on the Mexican Revolution. One thing that um, we will talk about in our question and answer portion is the fact that the Mexican Revolution was not just an integral part of Mexican history and identity, but also very influential on Frida Kahlo and her art. So to understand Frida, at least in part, is to understand some aspects of the Mexican Revolution. So that's going to be my focus today. Um, so we start off just simply looking at this iconic and, and very proud portrait of one of the most um, beloved leaders of the entire Mexican Revolution, Pancho Villa, sitting proudly on horseback. And the Mexican Revolution um, is one of those seminal moments in all Mexican history. Besides maybe the conquest itself, no historical event is more integral in the shaping of modern Mexico, modern Mexican identity, modern Mexican culture, and the art, including Frida Kahlo's, than the Mexican Revolution. As you can see from the dates, it lasted for a full decade, 1910 to 1920. And one of the most important things to remember about the Mexican Revolution is that it really does represent an idea that we're going to talk about more throughout this presentation, the concept of Mexicanidad, right? Mexican identity. Um, prior to the Mexican Revolution, the mainstream culture, the leaders promoted the image that was largely rooted in colonialism. The idea of leaders, the wealthy, the powerful, controlling much of Mexican life, um, coming from European heritage and really downplaying the contributions, the identity, the existence even of the Mestizo peoples of Mexico and the indigenous peoples of Mexico. The Mexican Revolution really does change that in a dramatic way. And so today, people of various identities, ethnic, cultural, um, gender, whatever identity that you subscribe to, um, there is a place for you in the Mexican Revolution. So this idea of being an all-encompassing sort of image of pride and heritage that includes so many different groups to this day is one of the reasons the Mexican Revolution is so uh, beloved and is so iconic. So let's talk a little bit about the specifics of this revolution and then these themes will come out, I think, as I speak. Now, the specific and immediate cause of the Mexican Revolution really is rooted in the leadership of the man pictured on the top right, Porfirio Diaz. Porfirio Diaz was a general um, of, of the Mexican army who was one of the more important leaders that assisted per, uh, the most beloved president of Mexico, Benito Juarez, and other generals to expel the French from their invasion of Mexico in the 1860s. Upon the death of Benito Juarez and his successor's um, term, Porfirio Diaz will parlay his military leadership into the presidency for himself in the 1870s. But he is, in some respects, a democratically elected dictator. He is able to manipulate the system, the political system in Mexico, to his advantage, where he is continually elected and re-elected and re-elected, and he rules almost uninterrupted for 35 years. And during this 35-year period, known as the Porfiriato, the era of Porfirio, 
he runs Mexico, politically speaking, much like uh, a political machine boss did in, um, in a large city or a large state, where not only was he the prominent leader that was officially, that had the official title, but Porfirio also had um, the carrot and stick policy. Local leaders, whether they be in the military, whether they be in the church, whether they be la uh, landowners, um, he would woo them and cajole them and encourage them to side with him on various matters. And in, as a reward, he would appoint them to positions in the national government that were very lucrative, that were also very prestigious. So if you support Porfirio and his agenda at the local level, you were handsomely rewarded. If you opposed him, there's the stick. Porfirio was notorious for using secret police and, and brutality to ostracize and, and destroy those uh, elements in Mexico that might oppose him. So he played this carrot and stick policy uh, very skillfully for 35 years to continue to rule Mexico uh, pretty strongly without any meaningful opposition. But of course, with a dictator of this nature, there is going to be opposition. It's going to be driven underground more, but nonetheless, the opposition grows and builds throughout that 35-year period. And as the opposition of Porfirio Diaz grows, um, it comes from many different quarters, right? And these different quarters, these different areas of Mexican society that will continually and uh, increasingly oppose Porfirio in, in uh, clandestine ways uh, will coalesce by 1908 into the origins of the Mexican Revolution. And so again, when we talked about the idea of the Mexican Revolution being very representative of various different people, various different identities, and various different agendas, you can kind of see that right here. The revolution began with a coalition of different agendas that all had one thing major, mainly in common, opposition to the oppression of Porfirio Diaz. So as you can see, um, the growing reform and radicalism, partly in opposition to Porfirio, by 1908 is housed by something called the Mexican Liberal Party. Um, one of the most important figures that helps to organize the Mexican Liberal Party was Francisco Madero. You can see him pictured on the bottom right corner. And Madero decides to run for president, not just for himself, but to represent this new party that represented a coalition of various forces, various agendas, various ideas that all were unified in their opposition to Diaz. Um, further up, under the category revolutionary diversity, you can see some examples of the diversity I'm referring to. Um, the Industrial Revolution is starting um, in Mexico during the era of Diaz, and in fact this is something that Diaz takes great pride in and great credit for. Um, one of the things that many people were very upset at Diaz for was that he um, helps to develop the infrastructure dramatically of Mexico. Railroads and, and ports and bridges and roads and other elements of infrastructure were built in many areas of Mexico that had virtually none of these things prior to his uh, regime. Um, but the problem was that the individuals that were building this were largely foreigners. Diaz was very good at cajoling foreign entities, including the United States, to come into Mexico and work with him and his regime to build these. So he would always brag, right, especially to outside observers, that don't call me a dictator. You know, you might think that my rule and my methods are harsh, but Mexico is moving into the future. It is becoming modernized in a way that it has never been before. And we don't have the ability to do this all on our own. We need outside entities uh, that have the technology, that have the power to do this in conjunction with us. So these are partnerships. But many average people in Mexico were increasingly upset that it wasn't a true partnership, that this was just an excuse for foreign entities like the United States to take advantage of the lack of infrastructure for their own self-serving uh, reasons, including money. So Diaz and these foreign investors were getting the lion's share of profits from all of this construction, leaving the average people in Mexico behind and often doing the work for these entities, but not getting their, their fair share 
of what they were deserved. Um, so that is one of the things that we see uh, contributing to the opposition to Porfirio Diaz. One of the byproducts of the Industrial Revolution in all parts of the world that it happened was the growth of something new called the middle class. And the Mexican middle class is, is still very small by the time we get to the overthrow of Diaz in 1910 and 11. But it did exist for the first time. A true middle class uh, emerges. And one of the benefits of having a middle class is that this is a group of individuals that have educational benefits and they also have the time to be able to sort of step back from their society and analyze it from a removed point of view. So many in the new middle class we're able to look at their society and say, here's what's right with things, here's what's wrong with things. And many of these middle class people will say, you know what, the number one thing that's wrong is too much of the profits, too much of the resources of our land are going into the pockets of foreign investors and a few connected leaders with Diaz and not really helping our country in the way that Diaz presents. So one of the uh, groups that was involved in the early stages of the Mexican Revolution were these middle class reformers. And Madero knows that, and he was, in some respects, linked with that group. Another uh, group to mention, Caudillos. Um, throughout Latin America, um, there's a concept called Caudilloismo. Ismo in Spanish means, you know, the concept of something, so, or ism in English. So, Caudilloism. A Caudillo is basically a regional strongman. Uh, many areas of Latin America, especially the more remote areas, are really controlled at the local level far more than some distant central capital by the caudillo. They're the, prime, the, the predominant landowner. They're the ones that control the local militia. They're the ones that uh, employ the majority of people. They're the ones that have strong connections with the local church officials, right? So really, day-to-day -day life in many parts of Mexico were far more controlled by the local caudillo or warlord or regional strongman than the government in Mexico City. And so more and more of these regional strongmen were becoming uh, antagonistic to Diaz, you know, using the carrot and stick policy for his own self-serving advantage and not letting them in in an equitable way. So there's more opposition from the local caudillos and their supporters. Um, another aspect of the Industrial Revolution was labor, industrial labor, right? A new kind of a form of labor that Mexico hadn't really seen before uh, workers working in factories, especially in some of the cities of northern Mexico, like Monterrey, um, labor starts to discuss some of the same issues that uh, labor was discussing in other countries in the Industrial Revolution. Workers' rights, equal pay, um, appropriate pay for the kind of work they did, um, fair working conditions, uh, the right to organize and unionize and collective bargaining. These are things that uh, the companies that were in, you know, cahoots with Diaz were very resistant to. And more and more labor leaders were starting to say, listen, we shouldn't just um, talk about these things, we should act. So there is more and more discussion of strikes. There are more and more discussions of organizing and more incorporation of ideas that the mainstream leaders were calling radical, the ideas of socialism and communism. The idea that if we don't get the rights that we are deserved as workers, then we should demand them, even if it means revolution, violent revolution. So labor leaders, labor organizations were also getting more involved in opposing Diaz along with these other groups. Now, a large part of Mexico, particularly the southern half of Mexico, we see a majority of the population uh, were of, in, of indigenous ancestry. Indian peoples that were living in their communities where they spoke their traditional Mayan language. Uh, they practiced much of their cultural heritage dating back to pre-conquest times um, and farming lands that they had been living on since before the conquest for hundreds and hundreds of years. But they occupied the lowest status on the social ladder, the ability and the opportunity for these folks to rise above um, the poverty that many of them experienced was very limited. Um, and Diaz certainly did not uh, give much uh, more ability for native people in Mexico to uh, elevate their social status either.
he looked down upon Indian peoples. He, he had a lot of racist um, uh, rhetoric referring to Indians as inferior in many key ways. Um, he actually wages war against some of the um, Indian villages in southern Mexico as a part of the um, Yucatan caste war that had been going on again and off again dating back to the 1830s. He continues that. And so indigenous people and their right to not only occupy the lands that they live on and preserve their culture and their identity, but also to glean the resources of the lands that they were farming and not have the lands and the, the resources uh, siphoned away from them to feed the greedy interests of these outsiders, um, that becomes a bigger issue to them. And so more and more indigenous leaders were starting to um, oppose Diaz and his regime along with these other groups. And certainly last but not least, women, right? Half the population roughly, women. And one of the things that's happening all, all across the Western world is that many women were um, embracing various forms of feminism. It's the earliest stages of Mexican feminism in the modern sense. And more and more female leaders were, you know, uh, bravely uh, standing up to the male-dominated sort of political culture that Mexico had experienced up until this time and saying we should be able to, if we choose, um, get into the public realm, pursue an education above a certain level, become literate, um, get involved in politics, have the right to vote, uh, have the right to inherit property from our husbands and our fathers and not just be treated as pieces of property. And so the feminist movement also will have an important place in the opposition to Diaz, who was very resistant to any of these types of um, uh, demands. So these are just a few of the various groups and ideas and agendas that were all unified, at least on the surface, against the oppression and the totalitarianism of Diaz. And the Mexican Liberal Party is founded in 1908, running the candidate for president, Francisco Madero, to usher in a new era of Mexican history. And Diaz, being in his late 70s, says, you know, time has come for me to step down. So that seemed to open up an opportunity for a new change. But then by 1910, he changed his mind. And when he says, I decide I am going to run again for president, and I'm going back on my promise that I was going to step down, that just intensifies the anger further. So in 1910, the election is held, and Diaz declares victory. And this wasn't just any ordinary victory. When Diaz claims victory, he claimed that he had won by something like 99% of the vote. He wasn't even trying to be subtle. This is one of the most fraudulent elections in the history of any democracy. Um, and so the fact that not only did he, you know, really... Uh, finagled the election in a way that he would win, but he does it, does it so over the top, this will be the trigger that will launch the Mexican Revolution. Uh, Francisco Madero, the Liberal Party, and many of these leaders from, from the groups that I've already discussed will gather together in San Luis Potosi, and they will um, issue the plan of San Luis Potosi, which was really the declaration of revolution. That The number one thing we are going to do is to organize and form an army and fight against the forces of Diaz and install Madero as president of Mexico as he rightfully deserved and oust this dictator and his uh, cronies from Mexico. Well, this is the beginning of the Mexican Revolution. And within a year, by 1911, by the summer of 1911, uh, the few forces that were still loyal to Diaz were defeated Diaz will flee the country, and he will live out the rest of his life in exile in France. So Madero will march triumphantly into Mexico City. He will decide we will have another election just to verify that the idea of democracy is alive, and he will uh, win this victory. So the first true democratic election in Mexico since the era of um, Benito Juarez will be the election of Francisco Madero in 1911. So at that moment, there was a lot of hope and a lot of optimism. Diaz is gone. Democracy has won. We, the people have unified 
and spoken with their voices, but also with their weapons. A glorious moment. However, this is only the beginning. Once Madero becomes president, he realizes that he needs at least some elements of the old Diaz regime as they transition from the old regime that had been in power for 30 some years to the new regime. So his decision to keep some of the um, officials and leaders that were associated with Diaz in his cabinet and in his administration will alienate many. Also, when it comes to the goals and the dreams and the agendas and the hopes of many of those that supported Madero, many of them feel let down. He was resistant to too much reform. He, didn't, he, he felt that going too far in a radical direction was going to be dangerous for Mexico. He was more of a moderate. And this is one way that we can see him much more linked with the uh, industrial middle class than to the more um, uh, what he called radical uh, demands of some of the other groups that were mentioned earlier, such as the ideas of two uh, key generals, Pancho Villa from the north and Emiliano Zapata from the south, from Morelos. Emiliano Zapata was the most prominent general that represented the interests and the agenda of the poor indigenous uh, groups in Mexican society. And he was somebody that advocated very strongly a whole redefinition of, of Indian and Mexican um, interaction with the land. Right? We will see his famous slogan, uh, Tierra, Justicia y Ley meaning land, justice, and the law. And this was a key slogan that they carried into battle to say, we're not just going to overthrow one dictator, we are also going to institute a new, much more equitable era for Mexico, especially for those that need uh, equity the most, the indigenous populations. And the land, the land is crucial, right? The ability to own one's own land, the ability to farm one's own land, the ability to derive and, and maintain the profits from one's own land and not have it siphoned away, and a sense of respect in the law. These are all things that were still largely absent from the indigenous communities in the areas that um, Zapata came from, such as Moreos, and this is the key of what is called the Plan of Ayala. So Madero, as the president of Mexico, was somewhat resistant to dramatic changes like Zapata was planning and, and discussing and he had already instituted in his home state of Morales. Uh, Pancho Villa has many similar kinds of ideas that he is promoting from the northern part of Mexico. The peasantry, the ranching, uh, the ranch hands, the small farmers of northern Mexico, similar kinds of demands come from Pancho Villa. So he is resistant to too much reform, calling it radical. Um, he does institute some reforms for the labor movement, but to the more um, communist-minded elements in the labor movement, this wasn't going far enough. He doesn't do a lot to incorporate the ideas of the, um, the feminist uh, wing of the movement that put him into power either. So there's a big question that still looms over the legacy of Francisco Madero, right? Is he a hero or a traitor to the revolution? And of course the answer is neither and somewhere in the middle. The fact that he was a hero is still something that many in Mexico believe should be a prominent feature of Madero. The fact that he did overthrow Diaz, that he did launch this era, and he did what he thought was the best um, course of action for Mexico in its future, wanting to maintain an even keel and a moderate uh, way of moving forward. Others will say he betrayed some of those that had brought him to power, and the fact that he kept uh, many of Diaz's supporters in his cabinet show that maybe he was more power hungry than he had let on early on. So this is still a, a source of very heated debate to this day. But nonetheless, he was not as uh, beloved as he was in 1910, just a year or two later. So many of those revolutionary forces will restart the revolution and they will start to fight against Madero. Um, Many of the groups will have their own conventions, right? And one of the most important um, groups to mention here as it relates to Frida Kahlo was Las Soldaderas, 
um, also known uh, colloquially as Las Aderitas. Las Soldaderas is simply Spanish for the feminine version of the soldiers, right? The female soldiers. And so one key aspect of the Mexican Revolution is that women didn't just stand on the sidelines and support the revolution and the men fighting uh, from, from behind them, uh, the, the battle lines. Women were very involved in a very forceful way fighting side by side with men and forming their own military units and even commanding soldiers in battle. And this is something that Frida Kahlo, for example, saw firsthand as a young, a young girl um, developing into a young woman uh, during the era of the Mexican Revolution. And this is very inspiring, seeing female soldiers on the front lines fighting, not just in a supportive role, but in a very proactive role. Um, some feminist leaders will even organize uh, a feminist convention uh, called the Complot de Tacubaya that was trying to formulate a more formal agenda, right? We aren't just fighting in this loose general way for the rights of women. These are specific things that we want addressed once the revolution, once we uh, have uh, achieved our agendas on the battlefield. Um, so Madero is receiving a lot of resistance on battlefields from some of his former um, supporters like Zapata and Villa and uh, Pascual Orozco. Um, and but also there's more conservative opposition too, right? There are many conservatives that thought he was going too far. So in a way, he's kind of a tragic figure. If he went too far in reforms, he would alienate conservatives and there might be a backlash against him from that group. If he didn't go far enough, he would receive and was receiving backlash from folks like Zapata. So in a way, and some historians you know, argue that maybe anybody in the position that Madero was in would have suffered a similar fate as he did. But be it as it may, he is ultimately overthrown um, by early 1913 by uh, Victoriano Huerta, and he is one of his generals. Once he is overthrown, though, not only does Huerta claim power for himself, he actually has Madero executed. And this sort of reveals that maybe the Mexican Revolution was entering a very dangerous stage where there was not as much of a sense of uh, organized, uh, thoughtful process moving forward, but many feared this was turning into a power grab. The fact that Madero wasn't just uh, overthrown and allowed the ability to flee the country as Diaz had, but was just outright executed. Well, Huerta, when he becomes the new leader of Mexico, will become very reactionary. He will, in some respects, go right back to the way things were under Diaz. Strong military control over many parts of Mexico, uh, many that even in the early years, uh, the early months had supported him and fought with him, now turn into uh, his enemies. He almost has Pancho Villa executed in one moment. Um, even though they, at one moment, had fought together against Diaz, now he considers anybody that wasn't full-fledged on board with his regime an enemy. Um, so he immediately seizes power, and by 1913, many in Mexico look around and say, three years of fighting, we are right back to the way things were. Just a different man in charge. We just simply replaced Diaz with Huerta. So the revolution resumes once again. Now, another figure deserves mention here, the man pictured on the bottom right, Venustiano Carranza, and he was an intellectual who was from Coila, and he was uh, a very strong advocate of the idea of a constitution, one unifying document that would help to address the issues of the various groups that were fighting in the Mexican Revolution. Um, that would be the way forward. Because if we continue to have round and round of fighting, and this general wins and becomes leader, and then another general overthrows him and becomes leader, we'll just have endless fighting. But if we can all agree on a constitution, a document that will address the needs and the interests of all people from all different parts of Mexico, all different identities, all different agendas, then we can move forward in a peaceful and an orderly fashion with the dreams and the hopes of the revolution now embedded in this almost sacred document. So 
uh, a convention is held with many of the key leaders in Guadalupe in 1913 to discuss the idea of forming a constitutionalist army. The idea of one army that was unified with the principle of fighting for a constitution that would represent all people from different parts and different identities of Mexico to overthrow Huerta. Well, at the same time, the United States of America gets more directly involved. 1913, we see the inauguration of a new president of the United States, just north of the border, of course, top right corner, Woodrow Wilson. And there's a great irony here. Woodrow Wilson was a president who had actually run partly on this campaign of we have got the, the United States has gotten too involved in imperialism in Latin America. He was very critical of the actions of his Republican predecessors who had directly uh, and blatantly just sent military forces into parts of Latin America, including Mexico at the behest of Diaz to glean the profits for large American corporations. He said, this is the time we need to scale back our imperialism in places like Mexico. And this is one of the reasons that many liberal reformers in the United States liked him and voted for him. Well, the irony is that Wilson ultimately becomes more involved than the predecessors he criticized, but just using different reasons. Once he becomes president, he says, again, I don't think it's a good idea for the United States to be too heavily involved in Latin American affairs for economic reasons. But political reasons, that's a different story. He sees the Mexican Revolution as spinning out of control. He wants to see a sense of stability and order in Mexico because that'll be beneficial to not only American business interests, but also beneficial to just stability for the whole region. Obviously, the fact that Mexico borders the United States is on his mind. And also, he's a strong advocate of a form of democracy. And he, he approaches this from a somewhat arrogant, um, uh, ethnocentric sort of uh, perspective. He literally comes out at one moment and says, I want to teach the Latin American people to be good democracies. Well, Latin American people had struggled with democracy for many, many generations, but it's not like they had no concept and no knowledge and no uh, devotion to the concept of democracy. Woodrow Wilson was presenting it as if there was no real meaningful democracy in Latin America in their entire history, which is simply not the case. So Wilson says, listen, I want to work with Mexican officials and leaders and do what I need to from the United States to make sure that democracy reigns in Mexico and that the war ends as soon as possible. But by doing so, he was injecting himself into a war that he didn't need to be involved in. And many in Mexico resented this. Here's a different president using different language, but the same ultimate result, right? An American president saying we need to get more directly involved in our internal affairs for their own agenda, whether it's money or whether it's uh, democracy or whether it's stability or whether it's political uh, ideas. It doesn't necessarily matter if there are there is more unwanted American influence in our country. So that's sort of the takeaway that many in Mexico on all parts of the uh, revolution will take with the um, inauguration of Woodrow Wilson. And by 19, uh, late 1913, he will get more involved uh, even uh, in, in the community of Tampico, which is near Veracruz, uh, where a number of American sailors were temporarily detained and then released. But then Wilson will take this as an, as an idea that well, there's instability and chaos and we need to protect America's oil reserves that are in Tampico. So for the period of about a year, the United States will not only bombard Veracruz and Tampico uh, on the uh, Gulf of Mexico, coast of Mexico, but will actually occupy the city for the better part of a year. So if the revolution in Mexico wasn't chaotic and, and damaging and destructive enough, now we they also have uh, uh, American military forces involved fighting. Well, meanwhile, the constitutionalist forces will oust Huerta finally by July of 1914, and Carranza will be declared as the new provisional president. And he wants to have a election and have a constitutional convention. There was a convention held at Aguascalientes uh, 
in the fall of 1914. But again, this attempt to try to bring together the various agendas and various um, ideas and leaders of the Mexican Revolution and have them submit to his agenda doesn't really work out. There were just too much diverse interests and conflicting interests. And so after the uh, convention sort of dissembles by 1915, we will see yet another round of fighting begin. Now pitting some of the other forces in Mexico against Carranza. Generally speaking, this new phase of the Mexican Revolution will see Carranza and his most prominent general of the Constitutionalist Army, um, Alvaro Obregón, pictured on the top right, versus predominantly Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata. Emiliano Zapata fighting largely in the south against the Constitutionalists and Pancho Villa fighting predominantly in the north. Well, Villa uh, was really having a tough time. Um, Woodrow Wilson had at this time decided the, the weapons and the support that uh, he was giving to some of these um, revolutionary armies, including Villa, is going to stop. He says, I'm only going to handpick one leader in Mexico that I'm going to support with my words and my weapons, and that is Carranza. Now, Carranza, of course, that's a very awkward moment because he needs the support, he needs the weapons, he needs the money, but he also doesn't want to be seen as too much in league with the imperialistic president, Woodrow Wilson. So it's an awkward moment for Carranza. What Villa does is brilliant. He says, okay, now that I have lost my support from the United States, I will fight with whatever money and weapons that I have at my disposal, and I will continue to fight against Obregón, you know, the main army of Carranza. Um, but Obregón had been studying uh, the battlefields of World War I. This is the exact same time frame as World War I is raging in, in Europe. And trench warfare was a defining aspect of World War I that made it a horrific bloodbath, right? Suicidal war, where in some cases millions of men charging against the opposite side's trenches will be cut down time and time again, in some cases for the better part of a year. There are some battles in World War I where the death toll goes over a million people in just one battle, like the Battle of Verdun, or the Battle of Tashendale, or the Battle of the Somme, or the Battle of the Marne. So Obregón was studying the trench warfare um, strategies and tactics of World War I in Europe and decides to employ it in Mexico. There were a number of um, railroads that were under construction where the ditches were already dug and he will turn these into de facto trenches and Pancho Villa and his forces will attack time and time again against Obregón who were well fortified in these trenches and will cut them down and decimate Villa's forces. So it looks like at this moment by 1915 that Pancho Villa's um, moment in the spotlight was over. He had very little support. Uh, he was very isolated. He had lost at this uh, bloodbath called the Battle of Salaya uh, to Obregón. And uh, he didn't have a stream of weapons or money coming from the United States anymore. But uh, this is also where Pancho Villa does one of his most um, dramatic uh, rises to um, greatness. He will decide to retaliate, in, in a sense, against the United States and their support of Carranza by attacking over the border, a border town of Columbus, New Mexico. Pancho Villa will attack this community, and local militia and him will skirmish before he retreats back into Mexico. Well, once this happens, Woodrow Wilson will then declare, not only do I want stability and order and democracy in Mexico for the sake of Mexico and these general principles of stability, now we are literally being invaded by Mexico, he claims. And so he creates a, what is called, punitive expeditionary force. And at the head of this, he puts John J. Pershing, nicknamed Black Jack Pershing. So Black Jack Pershing and his um, forces will march into Mexico with the goal of defeating Pancho Villa on Mexican soil and the hope was that they could capture him and bring him back to the United States to face some kind of trial. So from a better part of the year, 1916 into 1917, 
the United States and many military forces were on Mexican soil fighting against Pancho Villa's forces. Well, by the end of this, by 1917, the results are still debated even now. To this day, many in Mexico regard Pancho Villa as the victor of this engagement with the United States because he knew the deserts and the mountains of northern Mexico like the back of his hand. This is where he was born and raised. This is where he had been fighting for now going on seven years. And the idea that he was luring and leading uh, Blachek Pershing and his uh, American forces through the deserts on a somewhat wild goose chase, making them think that they were gaining the edge, but in fact just dragging it out and weakening them little by little over time, that was where Pancho Villa restores much of his reputation. The stealthy, wily, crafty, uh, guerrilla-style fighter w wins the day because by the time the American forces return to the United States in 1917, Pancho Villa is not captured, right? He will never be captured. But in the United States, the narrative goes that Pershing went to Mexico. The few times where they did engage in skirmishes, he did get the better, uh, at least numerically speaking, of Pancho Villa. And he will come back to the United States to claim victory and say, we taught Pancho Villa a lesson, even though we don't have him in handcuffs. Nonetheless, we won, militarily speaking. So two nations, two legends, two narratives, and two different outcomes, depending on where you are, especially in that period of time. Right? Uh, Blachek Pershing's exploits in Mexico, uh, being perceived in the United States as a victory, will actually help him to get the gig of the the, the uh, main commander of American expeditionary forces in World War I later that year when the United States joined World War I. So that's what he is much better known for in the United States. Well, back in Mexico City and the environs uh, of central Mexico, uh, Carranza was still holding on to power and he is able to coalesce a constitutional convention. And by the end of this Constitutional Convention, as you can see here in this famous picture at the conclusion of this convention, um, a brilliant document was forged. Today, one of the shining and crowning achievements of the uh, Mexican Revolution is the Constitution of 1917. Many of the more quote-unquote radical aspects and agendas uh, that many of the leaders had wanted were incorporated into the Constitution. Uh, the right to work, for example, um, equality under the law, regardless of ethnicity and identity, um, uh, basic labor rights, um, the end of a very strong coalition of church um, with uh, uh, state will come to an end, at least on paper, in the uh, Constitution of 1917. Many aspects that many of the leaders and the people have been fighting for will be in, in, incorporated into this constitution. But also, he doesn't go too far. The, there are a number of moderate aspects. Um, so people on all sides in Mexico could see something of themselves and some of their agenda realized in the constitution of 1917. And that's one of the reasons it has withstood the test of time. Now, more than 100 years later, it is still the working constitution of Mexico and many of the key rights that had been absent from Mexican law, especially on the national level, are now part of Mexican law and justice and society. One of the crowning achievements of the revolution, forged in the midst of a revolution. You know, many in the United States like to praise our Constitution of 1787, and it is a brilliant document in many ways. But this was done after the American Revolution had concluded. What Mexico did was, in many ways, equally brilliant, and they did so in the midst of a war. So this is a, a pretty remarkable accomplishment and a source of great pride in Mexico to this day. Well, Carranza was elected president in that same year, um, but there was still fighting going on between people like Zapata and Villa versus the constitutionalists, uh, as Carranza was uh, known to be someone that was honest himself but he did allow a lot of corruption around him, and so this perception of corruption will undermine some of his legacy and will continue more and more fighting. Zapata will ultimately be lured into an ambush uh, under the pretense of a, uh, a 
meeting, a, a, a peaceful conference and, and uh, discussion, and he will be shot as he arrives at the encampment in 1919. So this makes him even a bigger legend in a way because he was killed right in the midst of his uh, revolution and he becomes more of a martyr. So to this day, he is still one of the most iconic figures in all of Mexican history. His name, Zapata, and followers of Zapata, in Spanish, Zapatistas, have become almost a synonym for those that fight for land rights and for indigenous rights to this day in Mexico, and particularly in the southern parts of Mexico, such as Morelos, where he was from, but also other areas like Chiapas. Um, Carranza will decide to support a successor that was non-military, hoping to de-escalate the violence, but the fact that this was an obscure, hand-picked successor will make many think that Carranza wanted to continue to be the president, the real president behind the scenes, and not relinquish power as he had once promised. So this will continue the revolution further, and his most trusted and loyal general, Alvaro Obregón, will turn against his boss and work with other generals like Pancho Villa to ultimately defeat Carranza, overthrow him, and by 1920, Carranza himself will be executed. Obregón will then be elected president in 1920, and by this time, the revolution was essentially over. The last major army was under Pancho Villa. He will end the fighting once Carranza was defeated, and most of the forces laid down their arms. They were still skirmishing through the 1920s in certain remote areas, but the date of 1920 is where we see the ma major aspects of the revolution end. So the legacy of the Mexican Revolution, that's something we're going to be talking about. But let's just say again that it is the most iconic moment in modern Mexican history. It really helps to reshape and define a new Mexico and there's a very inclusive aspect to this, right? It launches a period of Mexicanidad, Mexican identity, which includes people of indigenous ancestry, people that were of mixed ancestry, people that were white, people that were wealthy, middle class, and poor, people from the north and the south and from the coasts, people of all different backgrounds and identities, men and women, different uh, gender identities, all groups in Mexico can really look at a place for themselves in the Mexican Revolution. And who represents this inclusive uh, image of the Mexican Revolution better than the great artist Frida Kahlo, who we are here to celebrate. There she is. And her artwork represents so many aspects of the Mexican Revolution, sometimes more overtly, sometimes more subtly. Um, and the reason is she was in part a product of the Mexican Revolution. It influenced her in political ways, in identity ways, in um, physical ways, and it, a lot of this is reflected in her art. Let me show you one final slide to kind of make this point strong. So as we conclude today, um, this is just a, a slide that will help us to understand a little bit of how the Mexican Revolution influenced Frida Kahlo as a person and her artwork. Um, not only did she have direct experience of the revolution, from the ages of 3 to 13, the revolution was being uh, waged, and in fact some of the battles and the soldiers actually were in her community, and her mother fed and even gave shelter to some of the Zapatistas on a few occasions, so she had direct contact with the revolution it wasn't just a part of the past before she was born. Um, the ideas of the revolution, the hopes, the dreams, and the promises influenced her very strongly as a teen and as a young adult. She had a very strong, independent personality. Um, she was one of the first women to attend public school in her area, and um, one of the um, important aftermaths and um, Legacies of the Mexican Revolution is the expansion of education to many of the communities that had largely no access to public education previously, and she will embrace this from the very beginning. Um, she continually is reflecting on and struggling with the concepts of identity in her life, and you see this in her artwork as well. Her ethnic identity, the fact that her father was uh, mostly white, her mother was of mixed ancestry, this is something she was struggling with 
throughout her life and it's in her artwork, right? Who am I? What is it uh, for me to be Frida Kahlo and what is it to be Mexican? And the idea of emphasizing all, not just we are one or the other, but we are a mix of things. We are a blend of things. We are proud of the different aspects of, of what it is to be Mexican. That is something that comes very strongly through her art that not only was part of her personal experience, but it was a big aspect of the Mexican Revolution. The idea of inclusiveness, the idea of diversity and duality, right? It's uh, this idea of one and the other, the two-ness. Um, that's also very present. You know, she lived different lives in different parts of her day, just like all of us do, right? So that's also something that is very present in her art. Um, she was influenced by many of the artistic movements that were part of or the aftermath of the Mexican Revolution, like the Mexican muralists. She marries Diego Rivera, one of the three most prominent Mexican muralists, along with Orozco and Siqueiros. And these three giants will paint large murals all over Mexico, especially in the capital of Mexico City, near where she was born and raised. And um, they will emphasize this Mexicanidad, this idea of an inclusive, diverse Mexico, past, present, future, indigenous, mixed ancestry, white, north, south, east, west, right? Prominent, educated, wealthy, middle class, and poor. All of these elements are very strongly featured in the murals and that, that Rivera and others will emphasize, and she was very heavily influenced by this as well. Um, she was influenced by Mexican folk art, the local um, flavor of different regions of Mexico. She will emphasize different regional flavors depending on the areas that she lived in. The idea of magical realism, which is very prominent in uh, the literature of Mexico, in the poetry, in the music. This idea of a blending of fantasy and the other world with the reality of day-to-day -day life. And indigenous cultures. She definitely incorporates a lot of indigenous ideas, Aztec and Mayan um, iconic, um, icons and art and cultural features in her art as well. And she was very influenced by the Cubists and the Surrealists that were very prominent in the time of the Revolution and in the 1920s. Um, she was a young lady in the 1920s when one of the big um, aftermaths of the Mexican Revolution was the expansion of the state, the, the nation of Mexico, uh, the bureaucracy, would become much more expansive and get much more involved in reconstruction efforts uh, to rebuild the devastation of the war, but also engaging in beautification projects like the public murals I mentioned a minute ago, or the expansion of public education to areas that were largely absent of public education previously. And the promotion, the very direct and intentional promotion of this more inclusive, diverse image of what it was to be Mexican, Mexicanidad, and also emphasizing the, the idea and the pride of the indigenous population of Mexico. And she was very influenced by some of the political um, influences during and after the revolution, such as communism. There was an important communist wing of the Mexican Revolution. She and Diego uh, were very uh, strong supporters of not just communism as a political concept, but it seemed to fit uh, some of the other things we've talked about as well. This idea of communal sharing, the idea of even distribution of land that many of the indigenous populations were, had been advocating and had been practicing for a long time. So there was that, and then of course the um, ambivalent relationship between Mexico and, and uh, the United States, either good nor bad. There are many positive influences and aspects of the United States, but there's also a lot of dangers, and she emphasizes both of those things in her political views and in her art. And last but not least, her status as a disabled person was with her um, terrible bus accident when she was 18 years old. Um, there was a streetcar that crashed into her bus and she was uh, severely injured, almost killed, and she experienced um, physical uh, ailments and suffering and pain throughout the rest of her life as a result. And this is a big theme that she emphasizes in her artwork as well. So Frida Kahlo is not just one type of artist, not just one style, not just one uh, perception or identity.
But she, as a person, and her art represent many different things that are happening in the Mexican Revolution, many different aspects of the Mexican nation at that time, and even to this day. People throughout the world and people in Mexico can see something of themselves in the Mexican Revolution, in the person of Frida Kahlo, and in the artwork that she produced that we will be witnessing at College of DuPage this summer. So that is the conclusion. I apologize for going a little bit over, but we will now begin the discussion portion of our presentation. Thank you so much. Take care.